Okay. Uh, so, um, in my day job, my domain is messaging. Uh, I work for particular software. We make a framework called N Service Bus. Uh, so, basically, I create tools for other developers that allow them to build distributed systems, and we also make tools for monitoring them. But indirectly, by helping our customers, I, um, I learn a lot about many other interesting domains. And uh, the thing that, uh, the main reason why I wanted to be a software developer is because I really, really like helping people. I think it's fascinating that by building software, we enable businesses to do stuff that wasn't possible otherwise. Like, take Netflix. Everybody talks about how awesome they are because they have microservices and because they handle failures in very unusual ways. But what is really exciting for me about Netflix is that they started as a DVD rental company, then they moved, they do, um, you would say, new generation of TV without ads, very different business model. And right now, thanks to technology, they made another change and uh, they are producing um, movies that they know people will love because they have all that data about what people want to watch. So that's really exciting and I, I want to help people to um, be more effective in their job, save them time uh, and, and enable them to do creative stuff and automate all the boring elements of their jobs. But of course, if you are a software developer, then you know that sometimes things don't just go exactly according to the plan. Sometimes we have this misalignment between what business wants, what they expect, what users want, and what the software actually does. So a great example was a few years ago, um, that was before I got my first programming job, I worked in a call center for a mobile phone company as a consultant. So basically my job was to call people, tell them, hello sir, your contract is about to expire, we have this new offer, uh, we have new promotions, we have new phone, um, and basically encourage them to sign up a new contract or upgrade their plan. What was surprising, a lot of people actually enjoyed those calls. They, they, they were happy that uh, we called them because they were too busy to figure all this out for themselves. But typically what happened, they say, you know, it's great you're calling, but right now I'm in the middle of something, I'm busy, I can't talk to you right now. Uh, so I have this and that, and yet another question. Can you please um, do the research, prepare an offer for me, and call me back next Wednesday at 11.47. I will have like five minutes to talk to you then. And that could be a very straightforward job, very easy. Only we had this software for managing all the calls. So from the consultant perspective, all you did see in front of your computer was a big button. You press it and you say, give me the next call. And then you will have like 10 seconds before you were connected to the client to see all the information about them. And with that system, it was impossible to schedule a call at a specific time. You could request it, but in practice, the best effort was like sometimes the call was scheduled two hours late, sometimes a week later. So that was totally unacceptable. Another problem was that by design, all calls were assigned randomly. So I couldn't say, I'm a consultant for this client, I already talked to them. Uh, and people really hate when every time a different person calls them and they have to explain everything all over again. So again, we couldn't accept that. So first, we were, uh, we were forced to come up with a little workaround, and the workaround was very simple. So everybody got a paper calendar, and we took all notes in this. Uh, so our wonderful, beautiful, modern, and I guess quite expensive software basically was an expensive, useless, annoying phone book. So that was a bit extreme example, I think, because like the fundamental assumptions about how, uh, how the work is done were completely wrong. But I'm sure that everybody in this room has similar examples. Like when we build features that didn't really work exactly as users wanted, um, and maybe we created systems that were a bit frustrating for customers. Um, so when I came across this book, when I heard about domain-driven design, I was really excited because, you know, all that uh, methods uh, for talking to users, for learning about the domain, understanding how they work, um, I was sure that this will solve the problems I've seen in the systems that I worked with. But um, DDD is a bit complicated. Uh, if you read the book, then you know that if you read it 10 times, every time you discover something new. It's really complicated. So when I tried to actually apply um, the, the information from the book, it was very challenging. 
and there were a few problems. So first of all, uh, people that already tried um, applying DDD in their systems, they said, you know what, um, there, there's so much to learn, there are so many techniques, um, you have to gain new skills to learn stuff, look at building systems in a different way. So we wanted to start easy. We just picked a few patterns and this is how we got DDD Lite. And as already a few people at this conference said, it just doesn't work. DDD Lite applying just tactical patterns without involving business uh, turns out to be quite expensive and you don't get the promised benefits. Um, so already people that had more experience were saying, you know, don't go down this route. If you want to do DDD, you have to do it properly. You have to fully commit, you, you need the revolution and change the way you build software. Uh, you have to do it by the book the right way. And of course, that's not a very easy thing to pull off. Another challenge was the team. So of course, you need to convince business experts that they need to talk to you, that they need to spend more time than they usually did. And for me, the main problem was that I was working on legacy systems. So yeah, you know, everybody was aware they could be better. There were some annoying elements, but they kind of worked. They provided value. So why change anything suddenly? Like, how did I know that it will actually improve things? Also, there was some pushback from my team members. So as programmers, we believe that we provide value by writing code. So even if you don't think this is entirely true, just think about this. Like on the days when you don't write a lot of code, when you have lots of meetings, when you write documentation, even if you know that it's important, maybe more important than writing code, do you feel productive? Like deep down, that doesn't feel like real work. We know all those other things are important, but maybe somebody else could do that for us, right? Maybe not us. So we try to avoid it as much as we can. And finally, my favorite, like over and over from experts at conferences, I've heard, you know, like DDD is expensive, it's difficult, it's a very advanced set of techniques. Um, there is a certain cost with introducing it to your organization. So if you want to uh, justify that cost, if you want to see benefits, then you better apply it to some complex domains, not to some trivial projects. Nobody explained to me, like, what do they mean by complex domain, how, how that domain looks like. Uh, but of course, if you read the book, then you think about something like holy domain of cargo shipping, right? Even if you don't know anything about cargo shipping, if you imagine, like, you have to move stuff around the world, you have to track it, you have to optimize the routes, calculate prices, clearly, this is a very interesting domain. And the problem is that most of the work that we do as developers is not as exciting, right? So all those things were kind of discouraging um, and many people think like, you know, DDD is interesting, but it's just not for me. I don't have the right team. I don't have the right domain. I uh, like my organization is not up for revolution and they get discouraged. But I think uh, everybody can benefit from applying some of the techniques and to tell you um, about uh, the benefits that you could see in your project. I want to share uh, with you a story about one project I worked on. Um, I picked this project because the domain is very easy to understand, it's very easy to relate to, but uh, the observations I believe are universal. There's nothing specific about this project in particular that makes it special. So everything started uh, a few years ago uh, when with my then not yet husband, we got a joint account. So of course we wanted to, you know, uh, take better care of our money, manage it more efficiently. We wanted to see where our money goes, how much we spend on what, and make some responsible decisions about uh, our finances. So in the beginning, we simply tracked expenses using the most popular financial application of the world, meaning Excel spreadsheet. And it kind of worked, uh, but very soon we started getting more interesting questions. Like we made some investments, we wanted to see what's the return on those investments, which investments were better than others. Or we saved some money and we wanted to decide, okay, so should we go on holiday? Should we pay off our mortgage? Should we invest that money? And getting that information from just a list of expenses uh, is not very easy. So we are a couple of two software developers. So of course, in that situation, you know, sooner or later, one of you 
just says, let's write our own app. It would be perfect. Uh, we will get all the features that we want, uh, and uh, we will have beautiful visualizations. We can use all the frameworks that we like just for practice, and uh, you know what can go wrong. And this is what we did, and we started noticing interesting things. So the first thing we noticed is that some expenses are kind of different. So, for example, I'm self-employed, so every, uh, from every income I get, I have to set, set aside some part of it to pay tax, taxes and insurance. And when at the end of the month you looked at the expense reports, you would see that we had this big category, a large chunk of all our expenses were related to me being self-employed. And that was kind of silly because, of course, my husband's also pays taxes, also pays insurance, but in his case, all, those, all that information was hidden because his employer covered that even before he got his salary. So um, that information was kind of noisy and kind of unfair. And another problem, even bigger, were business trips. So from, from time to time, my husband goes to visit customers in States or Canada. He spends a lot of money there because those countries are much more expensive than Poland, for example. And then he comes back and his employer covers those expenses. So if you looked at the, the reports, you would see this pattern. Like for months, expenses are at a pretty stable level. Then he goes on a business trip. We have this huge spike. And then everything goes back to normal. And the same for income, but with some delay. Right? So if you looked at the reports, it seemed like something interesting is happening there. Like it really attracted our attention. But in fact, like those expenses were not really interesting. They were different from groceries or other kind of expenses. We couldn't do anything about them. We couldn't optimize. So it was just generating a lot of noise. So we came up with a brilliant solution to solve this issue. We added a flag. For every expense, you could say, removed from, cash flow, uh, from reports, and then that expense wouldn't be displayed in their reports. Now, this is a very popular solution for uh, dealing with new scenarios uh, in many applications. And if you've ever tried it, then you know that it works for a very short time. Uh, so very soon we noticed, we kept forgetting this, adding this flag to some expenses that should have it. Uh, so at the end of the month, I had to look at all expenses and manually adjust it. And also we started kind of abusing it. So if, if some expenses uh, were too high, we wanted to hide them, then we added this flag, even though it wasn't according to the original intention. Another side effect we noticed is the code got really complicated. And it was difficult to um, decide how this flag should affect some new features that we were adding. I will talk about this a little bit later more. So in the end, we've realized that we are missing some domain concepts here. If you think about this, like everything related to my company, that's essentially an income cost. And everything related to my husband going on business trip, we decided to call it reimbursables. Right, so I believe this is a proper accounting term, but it could be very well a made-up word. Uh, as long as you know, it's meaningful for all the stakeholders involved, uh, that should be okay. And we noticed an interesting thing. So after we introduced those uh, terms, it was much easier to use the application as it was intended. We made fewer mistakes. We stopped cheating the system. Uh, the code after refactoring got much simpler. And last but not least, it was easier to add new features because we had meaningful concepts to discuss. They had some actual business meaning and not just, you know, have this flag which actually doesn't really have any business meaning. So then my sister borrowed some money from me. And looking at this experience, we had so many benefits for very little effort. Uh, we were thinking, okay, so loans, is it another missing concept? In real world, loans are very different from, for example, business uh, expenses, right? So we were thinking, um, you know, maybe we should model it explicitly. But after analyzing different um, scenarios, we've realized that in our context, actually, they're identical. We just want to see that some money is blocked. We can't access it for now. 
but we know that at some point in the future it will be returned to us. So we were able to keep track of that uh, expenses and loans, but it was not important for us to track. There was no additional information we wanted to track and we didn't need to um, differentiate between, between those two terms. Um, then we had another problem. So at the end of every month, I was looking at the expenses, I was analyzing reports, and I started becoming really concerned. Like, you have this large number of small expenses, and they really add up very quickly. So I, told, I said to my husband, you know what, Seb, I, I think we should really do something about this. This is not right. Like, we're really spending too much. We should, uh, you know, stop the line and uh, analyze our expenses and figure out how we can optimize it. But he was, um, he kind of didn't agree with me. He said, you know, I think we are doing just fine. You're overreacting. It's not like we are, you know, living paycheck to check paycheck. We have enough money. We're saving. So I think you are, you know, you need to come down and just enjoy spending your money more. Uh, so, so uh, I started thinking, okay, so maybe he's right. Like if he's right, then why am I getting concerned? Like, what kind of information am I really looking for? And I've realized that I want to make sure that we are saving enough money and that we are investing some for the future. So, you know, when we retire, we actually have something to live on. But looking at the expense reports, you don't get that information. You don't know how well you're doing. You don't know how much you will have saved for retirement. So we've realized we need a bit different, um, different view, different reports, different met metrics to track. And we found those. So we started tracking cash flow, uh, which is a difference between income and expenses. So that gives you information how much money is left at the end of each month, how much you're saving, how much you have available for investments. And uh, sometime later, I came this uh, interesting idea, very simple formula. So based on the savings rate uh, and uh, expected return on investment, you can basically estimate when you will be able to retire. So when you will have enough savings so you can live off your investments instead of you know, working for your salary, basically. And the savings rate is very simple metric. It's just the ratio of uh, your savings uh, compared to your total income. Could be calculated on monthly or yearly basis. And we started tracking those two metrics. They were became uh, they became key metrics that we looked at uh, when analyzing our reports. And this is where income cost and reimbursables really paid off uh, because uh, it was much, uh, it was really easy to uh, discuss how income cost should impact cash flow or how it should be uh, reflected in savings rate. Whereas if you just had some stupid flag, it was completely meaningless from the business perspective. And then we had another feature. And that was, uh, that was a big controversy. It took us weeks to discuss if we want to have budgets, if we need them, and what do we need them for. Uh, like my husband says, I'm a control freak, so I want to, you know, I, I want to know how much he spends and on what. So he was very uh, careful about implementing this feature. And, uh, and then when we agreed, okay, let's, let's do budgets, we couldn't decide how they should be implemented. We had very different ideas. And then a surprising thing happened. So I bought this book by a popular financial blogger, and he had a whole chapter about budgets, how to do them, like wh wh why do we need them, how that information is useful. And I read this chapter, then my husband read that chapter, and we figured out, you know what, like all this time we really were in agreement. We were talking about the same thing, just using different words. And we needed that book to realize that. We needed a bit different perspective and different kind of uh, explaining things. So, uh, of course, I could uh, tell you about more features and tell you more stories. That are, um, we worked on this application for quite a long time. Uh, but I think this is, um, those few examples are enough to illustrate some of the principles and some of the lessons that we've learned. So the first thing that we noticed uh, is when you, when you get started with DDD, uh, you kind of expect that now things will be different. So now you have this wonderful tool, you have this magic wand, you know how to speak to the users, how to learn about your domain. So um, maybe you want to do, I don't know, event storming session or use some other technique to, to figure out the requirements. But the expectation is that this time things will be different. 
this time you will get it right. Right, so uh, no longer this misalignment, no longer mistakes and uh, misunderstandings. But the problem is that with all those concepts, with all those requirements, everything looks so simple, but only when you look back. Like the actual um, process is very messy. You do one step uh, forward, then one step back. You say, okay, so maybe we should adjust this model. Then you go back to the previous implementation. You test different things, verify hypotheses, and uh, iterate a lot. And this is to be expected. You can't avoid it. And as a general rule, you won't get it right the first time. So the interesting thing I, uh, in the Eric Evans book is that he mentions only two prerequisites for domain-driven design. So one is close collaboration between uh, business and technical people, and the other is iterative development. I think very often we take the latter for granted because you know, we, we all are agile, right? So what do I mean? Um, you, you need to remember about uh, iterative development. Uh, but iterative development is especially important in the context of DDD because there's no point in having all those insights and learning about the domain if your model doesn't reflect what you learn. Uh, so uh, as, you, as you gain new insights, you need to refine your model and uh, explicitly capture the lessons that you've learned. So um, many people, when they get started with DDD, they, um, they, they kind of um, want to start by using all the tactical patterns. Uh, they learn about uh, value objects, aggregates, etc. But I think it's much better investment to actually learn how to write clean code, how to really well refactor things, and how to work with legacy code, even if you work on the Greenfield project, because for sure that will come useful at some point. Another thing we noticed, uh, so um, looking back, it seemed that you know, things like income cost or reimbursables, uh, th those were very important concepts for us. And very often when you talk to people about domain-driven design, for example, in discussion groups with your colleagues, with friends, you have this situation. They tell you, you know, I have this project, this is my domain, those are my requirements. I came up with this model, now please tell me, is my model right or not? Am I missing something? What do you think? And I think this technique is a great tool to discover some obvious mistakes. Uh, it's a fantastic tool to brainstorm so, some questions and come up with uh, so, some uh, ideas how you can verify if your model is really working well, maybe some edge cases that you didn't consider before. But generally, nobody can tell you if your model is right or wrong. It's not like uh, you work on model A, so, uh, sorry, domain A, so this model will be right. Everything depends on your context. Uh, and uh, some, some of the models will be more useful for your context than others. Like for us, income costs or reimbursables were really important. But if you are not self-employed, then why would you care about income costs? It, it doesn't matter, right? So it's not like uh, one model fits all the context. You have to really think carefully about your specific situation. And uh, related to that, um, well, uh, of course, we have to learn about the domain. Uh, we have to talk to many different domain experts. Um, but sometimes it's difficult to obtain that information. And uh, you could use some tricks. So uh, in some domains, it's possible to learn a lot by observing what your competition is doing. Maybe you can try use different apps. Maybe you can see how they approach things differently. What do they focus on? Like what metrics are important for them? Maybe look at their marketing materials, at their website. Like how the, who is their target group? And um, in, in the projects that I worked on, um, sales and marketing are usually not considered to be domain experts. But when you think about this, those are the people that know why people buy your stuff. They know what makes you different from the competition. They know what arguments to use to convince somebody that your product is the best. So they know which of the, of the features, which elements of the system are important. So uh, sometimes if you have the opportunity, it's a really great idea to, to talk to sales and marketing. And some of the insights might surprise you. Like in one project, I was uh, looking into very, very annoying subtle bug in refunds. Those were very difficult calculations. And uh, the business estimated that they were losing, I don't know, it was $20,000 per month because some refunds got duplicated. We had some race conditions, really nasty bug. 
And I started looking into this, and then somebody from marketing told me, why are you doing this? Why are you wasting your time? Why don't you work on the new UI thing? Just learn Angular and help your team. Because, you know, by, by having this new UI, we will be making much more money. We will be making, I don't know, $200,000 instead of 20, losing 20. Uh, so, as programmers, very often we assume that uh, the more interesting uh, piece of business logic, the more complex rules, the more valuable, valuable that part of the system is. But very often it's not the case. So you have to verify this assumption uh, because that, uh, that rule about complexity might be really misleading. <clears throat> and uh, so looking at this uh, experience with this application, I thought this is really interesting. So many people told me, you know, DDD pays off only in domains like cargo shipping. But here we have some stupid personal finance app and we had so many interesting insights. Uh, so I decided to share what I've learned uh, and I blogged about it. And some of the reactions were kind of surprising. Some people told me, okay, it's interesting, it's nice, but where's the code? Show us the code or it didn't happen. And you get that a lot with developers. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, intentionally we didn't want to, to show the code because then you get all those endless discussions, you know, tabs versus spaces, should you use this framework or that framework, or why did you call it this, or why is it in this layer, why didn't you use event sourcing? And I thought those discussions are not very valuable because you can't easily apply them to, to other domains. Um, and also in our case, like the code was not really that interesting, wasn't really that complex. But it made me realize one important thing. So as developers, this is how we see complexity. Somebody tells you, I work on this nice, interesting piece of business logic, and this is what you imagine. You have a flow diagram with so many nested ifs, and you can clearly see, right, this is something you know, interesting. So many edge cases, this will be fun. Or maybe coupling is the challenge in your domain. Maybe you work on some old system, and you, know, you touch one little piece of code here, and then suddenly something else blows up, and you didn't even know that this other system existed. Or maybe com the complexity is the scale, or maybe keeping up with all the JavaScript frameworks because you do front-end. Uh, but either way, we think about complexity in terms of technology. But in our system, complexity was something else. If you get started with personal finance, you quickly notice there are literally thousands of experts. Everybody has their own method. Everybody says, I'm right, all the other guys are wrong, just listen to me. Uh, everybody makes up their own vocabulary, and it's very difficult to make any sense of it. Uh, you feel confused and overwhelmed. So of course you could distill all that knowledge to the extreme. You could say, you know, like personal finance, it's trivial, it's just one rule make more, spend less, what's the big deal? And the problem is it's not very useful. It's not actionable insight. You need some more information. So you start reading and gradually you start noticing, like this guy and that guy, they use two different words, but really they're talking about the same concept. Or maybe uh, they use the same word, but really they're talking about two different things. And gradually that helps you figure out which of those concepts, which of those methods make sense for you and which uh, you might want to somehow incorporate in the system you're building. Another kind of complexity that we had were, of course, relationships. Some people say that all problems at the end are people problems. <laughs> and if you work for a big organization, then this is very visible. You get all those conflicts. Uh, people disagree, like, which part of the system is more important. Uh, there are disagreements on priorities, on values. But even in our tiny project, when you have just two people, we had so many arguments, like, should we have budgets or not? Do we spend too much or not? Is that metric important or should we track something else? So you get that a lot. And the interesting thing is that all those kinds of complexities are present in every project. And as developers, we tend to focus just on technology and we say, you know, the domain, this is for business experts. I don't care about this, let them handle that. People. This is for managers, for HR, I don't have to worry about this. But in reality, whether you like it or not, uh, you are affected by the, all those kinds of complexities. All of them will be present in your project, and the better you manage it, uh, the, the better systems you will build. To give you a very simple practical example, when code gets complicated, what do you do? 
if you are a programmer, you look at this and like, okay, I have to refactor this. Um, there was this nice pattern, um, maybe I could use it, or maybe I could take part of this code and move it to separate microservice. Either way, this is clearly a problem with technology. But uh, on the other hand, it could be also a problem with the domain. Maybe you have the wrong model. Maybe you are missing some concept here that should be represented in your model. And this is exactly what happened for us. Like when we introduced uh, income costs and reimbursables, the code got much, much simpler, even though it, you know, it was really simple change. Uh, or maybe people are the problem. Maybe your team needs training. Maybe they don't know how to write clean code. Maybe they don't know how to refactor. And you need to get the budget and uh, organize something. Um, so you could approach problems from different perspectives. Uh, this is a very useful tool. And the important part is that if you, if you, you know, use technology as a hammer and treat every problem as related to technology, then unfortunately some of the underlying issues would be unresolved. So you have to be careful about that and think uh, about different uh, options. So when talking about domain-driven design, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of attention is given to the concept of ubiquitous language. So of course, ubiquitous language is uh, important even if you don't use it everywhere. Uh, but for me, the in really interesting discovery was uh, one aspect that is not so obvious. Um, so I was um, lucky or unlucky enough uh, to work with business experts that were very, very good with technology. Uh, very often they knew SQL, they knew some programming language, they worked with uh, systems for a very long time, and they knew them better than even people that built them. Uh, and in one project it was really extreme, uh, because it, that system was a rewrite of a rewrite of a rewrite in production for many years, and all the uh, requirements that we got from business experts were in CRUD. So it was like, uh, if in column A you have value 1, then update column K with value 2, otherwise with value 3. And it went on and on like this for 20 or 50 pages. Uh, so that was a bit insane, but it was also very convenient. Because as a programmer, you got very clear requirements, right? This is a dream for every programmer, it's, uh, you know, usually business experts don't, don't know exactly what they want. But our experts, they knew perfectly what they were after. And you could uh, very quickly implement those uh, requirements. Um, it, it, you could write a lot of code in very short time. But the problem was that um, at later stages of the project, very often we noticed, uh, you know, like business experts didn't really um, think about all the edge cases or maybe they didn't realize there were conflicts between some of the business rules that they wanted implemented. Uh, so gradually we started pushing back on those requirements and we said, you know, wait a minute. Uh, we know that you know what you want, but we need to understand better, like what's the business meaning? Like why we're making this change? What does it mean? And as we got, uh, this information, as we learned more about the, the business requirements behind, um, uh, behind what they, they gave us, uh, we noticed that we could uh, come up with more effective solutions. So the solutions that we came up were more effective, they executed faster, they were easier to implement, um, they were easier to maintain. So in the end, we've realized that what we got from our business users, those weren't really requirements. Those were designs, those were solutions. And even if your business experts are good with technology, probably they are not as good as you are. So in, you need ubiquitous language not only to, you know, to uh, make business experts feel good about themselves or to build trust, you also need it because otherwise you just can't do your job. Otherwise your job is done by, by business and probably you will end up with suboptimal designs. <clears throat> and, uh, and related to that, um, you have to keep in mind that experts don't know everything. So this is quite obvious in systems that are innovative when you work on a problem that they didn't experience before. They need some time to do the research and figure out uh, how this problem can be solved. Um, but very often what happens, um, they, they can tell you what should be done, but they don't know why. 
Maybe because somebody 20 years ago told them this is how you do things. Maybe because they've always done it that way. Maybe they just know their own little piece of uh, process and they don't understand the big picture. So you have to challenge them on that and uh, collaborate to figure out their, their real requirements. And sometimes you can come up with something uh, better than what they originally had in mind. And uh, also it's interesting when you can involve many different experts, like uh, people from marketing or sales, and see how they disagree with each other. You know, when they face each other, when they talk, uh, only then they see all those conflicts. But usually they are pushed to developers and we have to somehow figure out how to you know, resolve this, how to make everybody happy. Uh, but if you push back and have experts to, to discuss this, then you can, uh, you can uh, get really interesting insights. And also, experts sometimes are wrong. You know, like in the, in the system that I told you about, in the call center, somebody thought this is a good idea to assign all calls randomly. But if you ask anybody doing that kind of job, they would tell you that you know, this is insane, this couldn't work, people hate that. Um, so you ha have to also keep in mind that uh, you can't just expect uh, business experts to come to you, give you all the requirements, and blindly follow what they tell you. You have to challenge them. And uh, looking back at different systems that I worked on, I, I really believe there are no boring domains, um, even though very often programmers think that their project is not that interesting. Uh, like a few years ago, I worked on this huge e-commerce system. It was uh, really, really complex. We did everything there, like uh, search, catalog. We integrated with third-party payment providers, with shipping application. Um, we, we calculated pricing, handled all the promotions, and back office, like refunds. But uh, when you looked at the code, uh, you couldn't really see any business logic. Like there were some rules that were in stored procedures, some of it was in data access objects, some of it was in controllers, just you know, spread everywhere. If you wanted to see what's the business logic, you would spend hours trying to you know, reverse engineering the code, basically. And one day my colleague told me, you know what, um, I know it looks bad, but uh, I, I feel like uh, we are justified in, uh, in this, that we have uh, anemic domain models everywhere, because this domain is just so freaking boring. There's no, nothing interesting, nothing exciting about this. And uh, I think seeing uh, complexity and interesting aspects of the domain is really kind of a skill. This is something that comes from practice. If you try doing it on some trivial projects, like, uh, for example, personal finance application, you can easily um, you know, uh, uh, discover other interesting aspects in other projects that you work on. So this is something that comes with practice. So I want to encourage you to start where you are with baby steps. Uh, don't wait for the perfect team. Don't wait for the perfect domain. Wherever you are, I'm sure uh, DDD will provide you a lot of benefit because any system would be better if we just uh, communicated and collaborated better with the business experts. And the easy ways to get started is um, confirm the obvious. Just try to rephrase what you hear. You can uncover, uncover some um, wrong assumptions you're making. Ask stupid questions. This one is hard, but it's very powerful. Um, questions like, how could we solve this problem without code? Or what would be the easiest way to solve it? What would be the hardest? Uh, how do we know this situation never happens? And get specific. So tools like BDD with examples, uh, they, they can provide a lot of value, even if you don't automate those tests, but you just write them in email or in Microsoft, in Microsoft Word and send them to business users to validate, you might uh, discover really interesting things. Like in one system I worked on, after three years um, of having this system in production, we were writing some tests and we realized that future date is not actually date bigger than date time now. It, it had some other business meaning. It could actually be from our perspective date in the past. But such things are very difficult to, uh, to discover if you don't, uh, don't have specific examples for that. And uh, I know Matthias had a workshop where they had some modeling heuristics, 63. Uh, so just pick a few and see what, what can you discover. Uh, and if you remember just one thing from this talk, I would be very happy if it was this slide. 
so everything you hear about um, here at this conference, at other conferences, what you read about in the books, this is all great. You know, sharing our experiences uh, is wonderful because life is too short to do all mistakes on our own. Uh, but generally, everything you hear is just an inspiration. It's not a recipe, it's not a prescription, it's not a step-by-step -step tutorial. You have to think for yourself. You have to challenge uh, um, and see if uh, specific methods actually make sense in your co specific context. And just because it worked in another project for some expert, it doesn't mean it would work for you. Or just because it worked for you in the past doesn't, mar doesn't mar mean that it would work uh, in another project with a different team. So keep that in mind. And if you, if you want to share any its insights, if you uh, find this talk interesting or have something to share about your domain, you can find me on Twitter or on my blog. And I have a little giveaway. Uh, so as I mentioned, I work on, uh, on the tool called N-Service Bus, which is used for building distributed systems. And uh, we have this wonderful course on distributed systems. I'm not really saying it just because I work for this company. It's really, uh, I think, the best course I have ever attended. And uh, by going to this link, you can register and access for free some videos about domain-driven design in the context of distributed systems. I'm sure you will find it interesting uh, and that can provide a lot of value in your project. Uh, I completely agree with you. There are no boring domains or at least today there are no not complex domains but what i'm missing here is uh, always also in agile and in ddd is really what is the core of what we are doing so basically the core domain is the uh, domain who gives us advantage over others and the same question i still ask in, in agile projects so why we are doing this again why we don't buy something so concentrating on the core could be a could be a differentiator for this. Uh, yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, but uh, sometimes, um, and, and I know other people mentioned that in other talks, that what you think is core changes over time. Right? So sometimes you start with some assumptions and you think, okay, this is what makes me different. But then when you actually have people using your application, you discover that uh, your assumptions were wrong. Or maybe, you know, your business evolves. And, Bus yeah. Oops, business also changes. But um, as you said, uh, ask questions or, or think, uh, basically when starting uh, with the DDD uh, mindset, I also would try to find the core or to elaborate more yeah. on this one. Yeah. But uh, I think it's the, the most important thing is to always keep the open mind and be uh, you know, aware that anytime everything might, might change.